Hey everybody, I am so glad you tuned in. We are right in the middle of a series called A Meal with Jesus. And while the series doesn't focus on food, it is about how food or tall glass of lemonade, places where we can sit down, slow down, and hear somebody's story, share our story of how Jesus has changed our life. It is about making connections with others. Well, for me, I'm sitting on my front porch in my nice Adirondack chair, drinking a cool glass of lemonade. Mm -mm, It is good. Where do you like to sit down and talk with others? Let us know. Type it in the comment section because we are interested in what you are doing. Now, speaking of doing something, coming up in just a couple weeks on June 3rd is our Daddy Daughter Dance. You can check it out right here and here and uh, sign up for it and find out more about it. But for now, come on, let's go worship Jesus. This is amazing This is a failing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross
have an anthem of hope. We have a reason to praise. We are redeemed and restored. You are the great liberator who ransomed us from our shame. Now by the blood of the Savior, everything broken will change. Cause this will be our day of victory. My chains are gone. Now I am free indeed. Every day is paid by amazing grace. All that's left is to celebrate your love. Has won. I'm free indeed. My jubilee has come. to the past Cause this is the year of the Lord Here at the foot of the cross We are outsiders no more You made a way through the darkness Into the marvelous light You broke the bondage that held us Now we are fully My day of victory, my chains are gone, now I am free in thee. Every day is paid by amazing grace, all that's left is to celebrate your love has won. I'm free in thee, my jubilee has gone. back through the grave. Turn my morning to dancing into the night I proclaim. Y'all heard those words, right? You shook the walls of my prison. You brought me back from the grave. You turn my morning to dancing into the night I proclaim. Yes, you shook the walls of my prison. Brought me back from the grave. You turn my morning to dancing, and into the night I proclaim that this will be my day of victory. My chains are gone, now I am free in need. Oh, this will be. you could join me today at the table. Now this might not look like your typical meal, but it's very significant. In fact, it's probably one of the most significant meals that you may experience. And this is why, because this represents the Lord's Supper. You see, as we've talked about Jesus sharing meals throughout the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, we've seen that Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, leaving a meal, but now he calls his followers to a very special meal. 
probably the most special meal that they will ever experience. And, and, and it just begs the question, why did Jesus invite his followers to share a meal that would define their salvation? But you see, this is what communion is. It is a meal. Jesus shared a meal with his followers. And in that meal, he defined their salvation through the bread and through the wine in just such a significant way. And so you have to think, what if the church stopped doing communion? What, what would difference would it make in your life? Well, here's the thing. I think it makes a difference in the message that you receive. Because you see, the Lord's Supper helps us to look back and it helps us to look forward. Let me just read to you from Luke 22. It says this, Then came the day of unleavened bread, in which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. So they prepared the Passover. And when the hour came, Jesus and his apostles, apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. You see, the Passover was probably the most special meal that the Jewish people that day shared. Because that reminds us of the night before Exodus. You remember the time of Moses, when the people were in bondage, when the people were in captivity, uh, and they said, let, Moses said, let my people go. And Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. And there were a series of plagues, and we know all about the plagues, the locusts, the frogs, the, all the other things, the river turning to blood. But, but here's the thing, is still, Pharaoh would not let the people go. And so there was a final prophetic word that was shared with Pharaoh. Unless you let my people go, all the firstborn of this community, this nation, will die. And so the Exodus is when God liberated his people from slavery in Egypt. You see, what happened was, is that at that time, on that night, they all gathered together. And they took a flawless lamb and they sacrificed it. And when they killed that lamb, they, they took the blood and they dabbed it over the doorway. A mark of protection. So that the spirit of death would pass over every house that had that mark of blood above the door that was given by the lamb. See, the people were rescued from death by the lamb who died in their place. And they ate that meal. They ate a meal of roast lamb. They ate a meal of unleavened bread. And, and it reminded them. It reminded them that they had been spared. It reminded them that the blood of the lamb had set them free and rescued them from death. But then what Jesus does is he says, so just remember this. He says, remember this because he says, this is my body. This, this bread that you eat represents my body. Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, my body, which was given for you. And he took a cup and says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And as long as you take this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. But he also says, some, look, um, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Because you see, Jesus says, there will be a day. There will be a day when all is made right. There will be a day when you will be with me in my kingdom. And that is the day that we shall feast. Jesus signifies the coming of the kingdom as a great feast, as a great banquet. Because somehow that food expresses community, expresses joy, expresses celebration. And what Jesus says to us is in this simple meal, he reminds us that the way of the way things really ought to be. Now, in order to understand really the whole fullness of the Lord's Supper, Supper, we need to go a little deeper. There's a deeper significance of food here. That, it, And just keep in mind, this is not just all about food. It's not like if you eat a certain food, you'll be saved. It's the significance of the food and what it means. Because, you see, food plays a part throughout the whole Bible. We go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Before the fall, food was the way we expressed our obedience and trust in God. Do you remember the story of Adam and Eve? The Lord God uh, commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will surely die. And so many people think it was an apple tree. Maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But I just know that I want to put this on the table to remind us 
that there is just one fruit that they were not supposed to eat. And, and it wasn't a magical fruit. It's just that it symbolized obedience to God to stay away from this one tree because that was the one that would um, be the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And, and, and so what they did is before the fall, they thought is they saw that everything was given to them. The food was provided for them. Everything was provided because it was a gift from God. And, and they depended on God. For their livelihood, for their joy, for their freedom. And all they had to do was stay within the parameters that God had outlined. But then something happened. The serpent was in the garden. We call him the devil. And the serpent in the garden said, um, God doesn't want you to eat that fruit because it's going to hurt you. God knows that when you eat it, you will become like God's. Well, they're already made in the image of God. But, but here's the thing. The serpent promised them something very enticing. And so now food was the way that we express our disobedience and mistrust of God. In Genesis, it says, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate it. And then the eyes of both of them were opened. You see, they didn't follow God's direction. And now food was part of a stumbling block. I think of the words in Romans chapter 1, verse 21. It says, For they, although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, sin distorts our relationship with God, including our relationship with food. And what we see now throughout the Bible is that what happens after that fall, what happens because of Adam and Eve, now we are separated from God by our sin. But here's the thing. Communion also signifies that because Jesus gave his life on our behalf, because he took the punishment that we deserve, because he paid the price for our sins, himself being sinless, he did it so that we would be forgiven, so that we would enjoy this close relationship with God once again. And so you see that Passover lamb was very symbolic, very significant of the true lamb, Jesus, who sacrificed his blood so that we might be spared death. And so what we see now is, unfortunately, as we um, are walking our own ways. Until we get back to that right relationship with God, we see that our lives are um, distorted. That's all I can say. Sin distorts our relationship, including our relationship with food. And so if you, I just want to focus on food. Not that I'm obsessed with food, right? But, but here's the thing. Um, we use food for control rather than for looking for God's greatness. Denying that food is a gift allows us to forget the giver. And food is meant to express our dependence on God. But we use food to express our independence from God. You know, I think of people with eating disorders. You know, I'm working with youth ministry for so many years. I, I had to work with a lot of people who were uh, going through some eating disorders. And, and anorexia was is it, just kind of a cruel thing because it gets people to be believe the lie that they're not good enough. And if they just had the perfect shape, the perfect form, and, and, and somehow food defines that. And so whether they, they don't eat food and whether they just want to have this image of themselves that they look better rather than malnourished, it's a delusion. But you see, it's an issue of control. It's self-sovereignty instead of trusting the sovereignty of God. Think about that. I'm in control. I don't need you, God. I'm not looking for your greatness. I want my greatness. Now, here's the thing. We see also how that plays out because we use food for image instead of looking to God's glory. You know, Satan tells Eve that she and Adam will become like God if they eat the forbidden fruit. But, but here's the thing. The, the tragic irony of this is that Adam and Eve were already like God. They were made in his image. In the image of God, it says that God created male and female. He created them. But we attempt to remake ourselves through food into a form that others will worship. And, and, and so we will do anything to look good, right? Because we think that's where our value is found. And food somehow defines that or somehow controls that. 
and it's used to, to place us as in an image that can be adored, worshipped. We think that will give us value if we have that look. And so now food becomes a control um, for image instead of looking to God's glory. Of course, you know, to be honest, we also use food for refuge, refuge, right? Instead of finding a refuge in God. You see, life without God is an empty life. We cannot fill that emptiness with food. We miss the opportunity to turn to God. We want to live by bread alone. We find true refuge, though, in the comfort of God and the true satisfaction and the goodness of God. You see, food can't be an escape, right? We talk about comfort food. I know I have my comfort food, right? Whether it's chocolate or sweets or Guadalajara Grill, right? I mean, for me, that's just something I just went, okay, that just took away the pressure. But is that really the right place to look for? Is that really the right place to look for comfort or refuge? You see, I believe that the only lasting comfort comes from God himself. And again, we substitute the creator for the created. And, and, and so... We see that food does a lot of things. It, it also uh, is used for identity instead of looking for God's grace. For some, food is aspirational. We use it to express the image or lifestyle to which we aspire. We use or misuse food to form our identity instead of finding identity in Christ. To achieve identity instead of receiving it by grace. So let's think about what certain foods signify, right? If you eat organic food, if you eat healthy food, right? If you like uh, whole foods, I like whole foods, whole paycheck, whatever we want to call it. But, but here's the thing. That shows that you are a healthy person, right? Maybe you equate barbecue. Um, some guys think that makes them manly or, or it makes you rugged. I don't know. But, you know, there's an image that comes with food, right? You know, if you have apple pie, what does that mean? You're all American, you're traditional. Or if you eat uh, fancy food, you're sophisticated, you're chic. I, I mean, it seems that so often food begins to define us and define, define our identity. But here's the truth. My identity is found in Christ. It is in Christ that I know who I worship. It is in Christ, that my value, my identity, my purpose, my soul is found. And, and so as we look at all these substitutes, now Jesus comes to us. Now he comes to us, and now we see um, promise and redemption embodied in a meal. And at that meal, the Bible tells us that Jesus took bread, and he broke it. And after breaking, he said, this is my body, which is given for you. In like manner, he took a cup. And he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As long as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And what's he saying to us? He's saying, you know what? Sin no longer has control. Sin is not going to define us. Satan's charm, Satan's lures, Satan's distractions, Satan's um, false promises are not going to win. But Jesus sets the banquet for us. He says, look what I've saved you from. I've saved you from death. Look where I'm taking you. I'm taking you to the hope and the promise of what it knows means to know me. And so now we see through this um, communion meal, this Passover meal, this the Lord's Supper. We, we understand the nature of God and our own identity. When we think of this particular meal, we see that this meal is an act of remembrance. And each time we participate, we're reminded of the cross, we're reminded that our sin is atoned for. We're free, forgiven, acquitted, adopted, and we're reminded that the cross is our model. We're called afresh to serve and a sacrifice. Communion is a remembrance. But also, this meal is an act of community that binds us together. We proclaim his death by eating together as a reconciled community through the cross. And the cross humbles us all as we see the extent of sin. And the cross exalts us all as we're welcomed into God's family. The family that eats together stays together, right? So you see... Communion is an act of community. 
But also, this meal is also an act of defend, a dependence. Dependence. Every meal is a reminder of our dependence as creatures of God. You see, the Bible says, man that shall not live by bread alone. What do we think when we think of the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. You know, oftentimes I'm reminded that I've been so fortunate to never have really known true hunger that my meals have been provided. And I believe that those are from the hand of God. And so I don't know if you say grace when you have a meal, and sometimes it's a quick quick little thing, but, but at the same time, I think it's a moment to stop and say, Lord, this came from you. I'm grateful for your provision. I'm grateful for your care. So we eat bread rather than just saying words to remind us to rely on God's grace. Also, I want you to see this meal is an act of participation. We're not observers around the communion table. We're participants. What does Jesus say? Do this in remembrance of me. He doesn't say, watch this. He doesn't say, look what I'm going to do. He says, do this in remembrance of me. This is the meal that reminds you. It brings us together. It shows us that we are dependent on God's goodness and grace. And we actually have the opportunity to participate. See, communion means participation. And so as we do this in remembrance of him, we are reminded once again of his great love. And last, I want you to see that, that this meal is an act of formation. You see, participation in the communion meal is habit forming. Each time we participate, we're really learning and learning our role. I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 11.26. This is what it says. Whenever you eat this bread, drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You see, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink in the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Anyone who is hungry should eat something at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. You see, as I look at this passage, as I see what this communion is all about, this is a foretaste of the kingdom. This is a feast of friends. This is a meal in the presence of the Spirit. And isn't it fascinating that God would choose to use a meal to remind us of how he has rescued us from death, to remind us of his love for us, to remind us to also look forward to see that there will come a time when we will taste the banquet of the kingdom of God and we shall sup with Jesus and we shall enjoy his presence and there will be celebration and food and hope. The Bible says that Jesus longs for that day with us. And so all I can say to you is remember this meal because this meal reminds us of the incredible love and sacrifice of our Lord and the life ahead that he has called us to. So Lord, I just pray that we would see meals as an act of salvation, as a way to express our dependence on you, as a way to, depend, to express that our image and our identity is found in you, that you are a refuge. And Lord, I pray that we eat any meal that are reminded of your grace. But most importantly, when we share this meal, when we share this meal, we are reminded of your incredible love, your sacrifice on our behalf. So if you're listening to me right now and you say, you know what, I think it's time I take you. I want to be a part of God's family. I want to share in the feast of the world. So you might just want to stop right now. You might want to just get some bread, get some juice like I have. And take communion with me right now. So let me just say these words to you on the night on which he was betrayed. I found you once again. Our Lord took bread. And after he broke it, he said, This is my body, which is given for you. So I just encourage you to taste and see that the Lord is good.
Yeah, you take the cup. I said, this cup is a new cup of my blood. As long as you take this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So I say to you, drink. Taste the Lord is good. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this reminder. Thank you for this meal. It's so much more than grape juice. It reminds us of our salvation.